From the European Parliament here in Brussels, this is Raw Politics. Thank you for joining us tonight, and this is what we have coming up on the program. France threat, how a growing political crisis for Emmanuel Macron could threaten all of Europe. Not backing down, Theresa May vows to press ahead with a Brexit vote, but could it be delayed from Tuesday? Border divide. In a special report, we visit the Scottish border to talk about Brexit hopes and fears. Nazi honeypot. An elaborate online scheme in Germany gets far-right members to out themselves. And in tonight's Raw Moment, the Queen and one less than impressed young visitor. Welcome to the program tonight. I'm joined by Nina Schick, Director of Data and Polling at Rasmussen Global. Nina, which are the stories are you watching closely? I'm very interested in this Nazi honeypot scheme, which has kind of caused a lot of controversy in Germany. It did indeed, a uh, staring uh, controversy there. All right, joining us tonight also is a Swedish MEP from the Liberal Group, Yasenko Selimovic. Yasenko, which of the stories are you watching? I think Brexit is emerging. It's one of the urgent things, so I, I would go for that. All right. Brexit all week long, in fact. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and joining us also is Pierre Benazir, journalist and correspondent for Radio France Internationale here in Brussels. Pierre, what about you? Well, I'm mostly concentrated on what's happening in France right now, the uh, Yellow Vests movement, which seems to be spilling over the borders around in Europe, but mostly in France, no, and it's very explosive. We've seen it in Brussels as well. All right, and that is exactly where we are beginning, because is it too little, too late? Well, that is the message from Yellow Vest protesters and Emmanuel Macron's political opponents after the French president backtracked and withdrew a fuel tax hike that has ignited an international movement. News of the about face came from French Prime Minister Mr. Edouard Philippe late yesterday, but instead of appeasing protesters, their wish list is actually growing. They now want a wealth tax that President Macron cut to be brought back. The Elysee has signaled it's prepared for further talks as France braces for more violent protests this weekend. And meanwhile, in the National Assembly, opposition politicians are considering a vote of no confidence while offering scathing criticism of the, quote, presidential monarch. Here is what far-left opposition leader Jean-Luc Mélenchon had to say. Allez dire au monarque présidentiel que les gens raisonnables sont sur les ronds-points et dans les rues et qu'ils n'en partiront pas avant que vous ayez cédé pour de vrai ou que vous soyez parti. Cédez ou partez et quand vous partez, cédez avant. So we see Jean-Luc Mélenchon there from the far left and we, we've also seen people from the far trying to take the movement or hijack the movement, if you can use that word. Are they the political winners in this uh, when Macron is down as he is now? Well, for the time being, they are winning nothing. I mean, we uh, could be quite surprised by the fact that they are not wearing their yellow vests inside the uh, Assemblée Nationale, um, which one Serb MEP, uh, MP did uh, in the parliament in Belgrade, but they are not doing it because they seem to have realized that there, there is no way for them for the time being to, uh, well, to hijack this movement because it's very apolitical. So, and the reason why we, I think we don't hear Emmanuel Macron speaking about it and only uh, his uh, proxy, his um, mm. Prime Minister, Edouard Philippe, is that no one in France seems to have found the uh, proper political explanation for mm. it. And seems, no one seems to have Good. found where to draw the political lines because they are very absent from this. For now, but, but still, even if you can't, still, you can't find a political line, um, Macron is the poster boy for centrist politics. Is this dangerous for Europe when, when you know, you're looking at extreme forces saying, oh, someone who is a centrist poster boy in trouble? Well, uh, this is a very French way, um, pardon me saying that, this is a very French way of protesting. You know, it's mm. inventing the, the different ways of taking decision. It's taken on the street, it's French are used to it. They used to protest in that way. Mm. And this is, this first, the violence they are making has to be condemned in every way. And secondly, we have to bring back the thing to the parliament. But if you put it in the parliament, then you suddenly realize that Mélenchon and the, and the, those supporting it doesn't have a clue about to, to win that vote. But this is something very French. Would it, would it be spread to the rest of the Europe? No, I don't think so. Would it be dangerous for the, for the French politics that somebody who is centrist is going? Mm -hmm. I don't think it will be a big mess because this is kind of, we are used to it in France. So, Nino, when, when you do, you know, do you do polling? This is, a, is this a, taking the temperature of the public. What do you think? Is this going to spill over and become more than just a French problem? I certainly think it's true that it's very French in its style, street protest. 
Nonetheless, I think there is an important kind of global correlation to be made across the Western democratic world. And that is that there's a huge crisis of trust in democracies worldwide. The narrative that we see in France, this is the people, quote unquote, loosely defined against the elite, is a narrative that we see in Western democracies across the world from the United States to the United Kingdom and indeed France. So I do think there is a chance that this can spill over this kind of politics, this kind of anger, this visceral anger is real. And the other lesson that we should learn from France, which is increasingly becoming true in global politics, is that these type of movements can now spontaneously arise with no leader. You know, it's always organized on social media. There's no kind of aims and lots of different people have attached themselves to this. So I think this is very much a global trend. I think that is true because we saw that a few years ago also in America, in, mm -hmm. in different parts of the world, this, you know, uh, looking at the elite as, as, as the enemy, so to speak. All right, our reporter, Annelies Borja, she has been talking to meeting Yellow Vest uh, protesters to find out more about their lives and their demands. And she met with pensioner Daniel Kenne, who says he's struggling to afford food. Let's take a look. What's qui est difficile dans votre vie à vous, par exemple? Ah ben, pour manger. Hein, euh, pour euh, des aides, hein, parce que des fois on dépasse d'un euro donc on n'a pas d'aide. Et moi personnellement, euh, je suis honnête avec vous, euh, j'aime pas mentir, ça, ça fait que je reste comme ça, comme si que ça, ça allait tout bien, mais ça va pas du tout. Personnellement, euh, je regrette d'être français, je regrette. Ça fait mai 68, et là c'est parti pour, et peut-être peut pire, peut-être pire. When you see that, I mean, you know, these are your, your countrymen, you know, French people. This, this really is a narrative and this is the feeling. It's about jobs, it's about feeding their children, it's about families at the end of the day, really. It is quite. And uh, Nina was making a very good point just before that. The fact that uh, the, the people we see in the um, Yellow Vests in France uh, are not really the uh, disenfranchised. They are the uh, uh, working class, lower middle classes, mm -hmm. people who seem to have lost their confidence in the uh, parties they, to mm -hmm. they used to vote for. Um, well, social democracy in France, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Socialist Party has utterly lost its electorate uh, at the last elections. Um, the right, classical right-wing movement, Republicans, tried to hijack this movement and now they are backpedaling back a lot. But we de definitely see the, see the emotion there in... in oh, in Right, yes, and there is no... The, when you talk to these people in the streets, the same, it's the same in Belgium for the few that are doing yeah. the same. They have no money in, the, in their pockets at by the I mean, 15th of the month. That is the bottom line. And now, let, let's cross to Paris first, because uh, former MEP with the Greens, and he's a presenter of your news' Uncut series, Daniel Conbendit. He is joining us now. Daniel, you have been... Uh, you know, you're, you're not no stranger to this. You were there at May 68. The pensioner we just saw in that clip, he said he was there at May 68. When you're looking at the Yellow Vest protesters, what goes through your mind? Well, we know that you have a, a, a social split in France. 95, you know, Chirac in his uh, campaign talked about this, la fracture sociale, the social split. So it's, it's front and no government, left, right, did, un, did really find a solution to this social split. It's growing and growing. And this is a deep feeling of the people on the street. Uh, the Yellow West is something very interesting because these people, no, nobody knew them. Now they have a yellow vest and you from our news, we from, from the other. They go to them and ask them something. So they exist. For the first time, they seem to exist. This is, if you want, the reason of the movement. Now we have to, to talk then about the quality of the movement, who is behind. And the winner of the movement will be the far right. I mean, Daniel, uh, when you when we look at the the methods that is being that is being employed by the yellow vest, I mean, a lot of them, you know, are just protesting in the street. But we see some violent pockets. That aside, this more aggressive and defiant way of protesting does the, the do the ends justify the means? No, no, it is an old story. Of course, not the end that doesn't uh, justify the means. The problem is that look, you had uh, last uh, uh, two weeks ago Saturday. You had two demonstrations in Paris. Yeah, you had the yellow vest, you know, on the struggling with violence, Champs Elysees, Etoile, and you had four kilometers uh, away a, a, a big demonstration, bigger, thirty thousand people against violence against women. There was no violence. Nobody talked about it. 
the TV was not there, the media were not there. You know, this is the problem, you know, that they think if you want that you talk about me, then and you do it. If there is a fire, everybody's yeah. coming. And Daniel, as you're saying that there's really been a lot of people, it's reaching, you know, possibly critical mass in the next few days. But, and you were talking about the far right trying to, to be, to gain, to take advantage of, of this movement. So really, are they the winners here? There will be the winners. If it continues like this, there will be the winner. The result, you will see it at the European election. The, 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 you, I mean, you know, you have to listen. I, I had an argument I, all the week in Paris. I had an argument you know, with Yellow Vest. And then it was the man. He said, yeah, I'm, the, I'm the, from the countryside. And you look at the website. And the, his website was full of uh, articles uh, against Muslims. And you can, you can see the people. So, and if one like Wayne, you know, said yesterday in the evening, you know, what do you want? I want to go to the Elysee. And what do you want to do there? I want to be there. And, and then, then I will be the president. And, and I that, mean, you know. Yeah, we're looking, we're, we're looking, at, we're look, we're looking at elections, uh, European elections coming up. But you're also just, why do you just bring the, the, the far right? I mean, we also have voices on the far left who probably also want to take advantage of this movement. And in the context of the European elections, we're looking at both extremes, aren't we? Yes, but, you know, history has showed us that such a crisis, social crisis, it was the same in Germany in the 30s, you know, there were the big crises, there was the big unemployment, and the communists thought it will go to the left, it will go to, towards socialism. It didn't. Never, never set such social crisis go to the left. It always go to the right. And look, what was the first political proposition from a lot of uh, persons who were speaking for the movement, you know, what they asked, they asked that the general Pierre de Villiers became French president. They want a general at the top of the co of, of of the country. Is it a left uh, proposition? All right. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, for joining us tonight. Former MEP from the Greens, Daniel Conbinde, talking to us there. I'd like you to react to what he was saying about you know the threat that he saw is more coming from the far right, the opportunity for the far right. I, I, I think things have to be distinguished here. The far right will have advantage of, of the in the parliament they will be bigger and they will we will end the the parl next parliament elections with a kind of quite uneasy parliament but not because of this this is not the reason why we will have a parliament full of, of extreme right mm. this is pardon me saying it one more time this is very local french thing okay this is not kind of influencing the, two, the whole Europe. This is not going to spread around. This is not going to spill he over to the other. He seems to be worried country. about it, though. I know, but this is... Uh, okay. French like to believe that they are center of the world, but they're not. <laughs> Would you like to re react to that as a <laughs> Sorry. <Frenchman? laughs> right. Well, he, uh, Daniel Kambedik has an experience in this right. kind of, uh, obviously, um, well, situations. But right. I, I do not entirely agree with him on the fact that there is a um, specific political colouring. Sociologists have been looking into the situation for the past fortnight and they seem to think that it's a very apolitical movement in a sense. For, yeah, for now. Go ahead, Nina. I think I want to bring it back to the crisis of trust. So at Rasmussen Global, we did a study of 52 countries, 150 thousand people. And what we found is that across the democratic world, the crisis of trust was huge. So over 60% of people living in the free world said, the voice of people like me is never represented in politics. 64% of French people said that. Now, when you have this crisis of trust, when you feel your government is no longer delivering for you, populists, demagogues and charlatans can always exploit that, be that on the left, or the right, and I think that certainly is happening on both sides of the political spectrum in France and around the Western world, to be honest with you. Okay, I will do a, a quick round because uh, we're watching this unfold, but where are they heading, the Yellow Vest protesters? What do you think is happening next? Well, we know that someone is heading down, it's uh, Emmanuel Macron, whose mm -hmm. uh, approval rate, I just checked it, is lower than 19% right now. Uh, so it's going to reach the uh, extreme lows that Francois Hollande had mm. before. Um, he's, on, he's not on uh, the way out, but he's fa the government is facing a wall. And the yellow vests, their demands were actually met uh, right. when the government announced uh, Monday that the uh, uh, taxes were withdrawn mm. and they probably won't be reinstated. They'll probably be, be continuing. Do you think they're emboldened? Just very quickly, what, well, what's I, I next? Don't know. I, I see the problems of dealing with this for President Macron. 
I, th I think this will be going to be difficult because he's starting to back off from the certain demands. Mm -hmm. Then they demand even more, and you can see the logic of it going further on. I don't see that this will be solved in a tomorrow. I mm -hmm. think this will be a big problem. It will have a le affect the election in France, yeah. but and, not in other countries. And Nina. On a rather depressing note, I'm going to say <laughs> that even if this protest fizzles out, the kind of key dynamics, you know, the kind of it's visceral anger that we see in France on the streets and, again, across the rest of the world, I think is here to stay. At Until least that the trust to... deficit is addressed, as you've, been, as you've been pointing out. All right. Well, just across uh, the French border in Luxembourg, the government has come up with an environmental policy which is slightly more popular with the public. Let's take a look. Welcome to Luxembourg, one of the smallest and richest countries in the world. And it's just gone the extra mile to prize people from their cars and onto public transport. From next summer, traveling on the country's buses, trams and trains will be completely free. The Grand Duchy is the first country to take this step and it could prove to be the ticket to a greener future. So do you think the French can learn from this incentivizing rather than punishing by tax? What do you think, Nina? I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. And of course, we know that in the future, this is the way for cities and countries to be run. You know, the environmental threat is real. I don't know how something that you can roll out so easily in Luxembourg. Yeah, to be, be fair, it is. Yeah, exactly. to be fair, it is a much smaller country, much yeah. richer country as well. All right, coming up on raw politics, we are just days away until British uh, uh, MPs vote on the Brexit deal, and we speak with a few of them in London on why they are voting for or against Theresa May's deal. Plus, for you, we take you to the English-Scottish border to hear what residents really think about life after Brexit. Our special report is up next. Don't go away. Welcome back. Now, Michel Barnier appears to have little sympathy for the plight of UK Prime Minister Theresa May. Europe's chief Brexit negotiator says British politicians need to take responsibility for their actions. His comments come as British MPs debate UK Prime Minister Theresa May's hard-fought deal, a decision Barnier calls, quote, lose-lose and an exercise in damage control. MPs are set to vote on Tuesday, but there is now speculation about whether that vote will be delayed to avoid a large and potentially devastating defeat for May. And here's what Michel Barnier had to say at the European Parliament today. Ce moment est grave pour l'Europe. Ce n'est surtout pas et certainement pas le moment d'une quelconque célébration, puisque, permettez-moi de le dire comme négociateur de l'Union européenne, cette négociation est négative. C'est une négociation négative. Le Brexit n'a aucune valeur ajoutée. C'est lose-lose. Et donc il s'agissait dans cette négociation, il s'agit encore de limiter les conséquences. Well, our political editor Darren McCaffrey is just outside Westminster tonight. Darren, good to see you there in London. Okay, so there's a lot of talk about what is going to happen next, uh, that May's deal is not going to get through. We heard Barnier there saying, you know, it seems like there is no appetite to renegotiate. We don't know whether, you know, uh, May's deal is going to get through or that vote is going to be delayed. So how will all of this affect what's happening on that side, Darren? Well, it's interesting listening to Michel Barnier there reiterating the Europeans' line that this is the only deal, the best deal, uh, and that people should back it. Of course, that plays into Theresa May's hands. They are trying to give her some political support uh, from uh, Brussels. She uh, reminding everyone uh, yet again today uh, that this really was the only deal on the table as far as the European Union were uh, concerned. Uh, Philip Hammond, who's the Chancellor here in the UK, stood up in Parliament earlier on, Tessa, uh, saying that people were dis delusioned. Uh, if they thought that somehow there would be re, uh, a renegotiated uh, deal. Uh, however, it must be said that most MPs think, well, Brussels would say that, wouldn't they? Theresa May would say that, wouldn't uh, she? For the Labour Party, they believe that they can renegotiate a softer form of Brexit. And for those Brexiteers, they think that a Conservative leader, whether it be Theresa May or not, can go back and get rid of this most hated uh, backstop. Whether the vote goes ahead on Tuesday, well, Tessa, when you look at the arithmetic, it's really, really uh, difficult. Uh, upwards of 100 Conservative MPs now publicly saying they would vote against it. That's why we have these calls, or at least rumours, uh, of suggestions that the vote could be delayed from Tuesday, uh, though that 
I have to say, seems unlikely. It'd be a real sign of weakness from the Prime Minister to delay the vote. And there is little, actually, I think she could probably do in the interim period uh, between delaying it, having it again. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure that will happen. What have MPs been telling you today? Yeah, as you say, I've been speaking to a, a wide range of MPs today, those backing May's deal uh, and those who certainly are not. And I started off by asking uh, some of them uh, why uh, they were or how they were going to vote uh, on Tuesday. Let's have a look. Sadly, I've come to the conclusion that, that I won't be able to support the government in, in, the, in the division lobbies on Tuesday night. And it's for me, I'm a serial loyalist. I've been in Parliament for three and a half years. I've never rebelled against the government. To be honest with you, I'm still uh, considering the matter. Uh, these are grave issues that will live with us for many, many years uh, to come. And they require serious consideration, deliberation. I want Theresa May to lose heavily because I don't think anything else will convince her that she isn't going to get her own way and she seems to be de prepared to destroy everything around her in order to get her own way. The slight problem is we've got a 585 page document, a draft treaty, and unless there's a substantial rewriting of that document, we're going to need uh, serious reassurance that so we can get out of it unilaterally. This deal is, is not worth the paper it's written on, of which there is an awful lot, um, because in the end, the fundamental thing for me is that it makes Britain a rule taker without a voice in those rules. I would be happy to support this draft agreement if there was a time limit to the backstop and that's what I'm worried about at the moment. This deal simply is not good enough and I think we should then say we want a free trade agreement. I've been very straightforward. A Super Canada deal would, would be my ideal. But if not, then we need to prepare not for no deal. Let's call it a clean global Brexit. That's the phrase that I've coined. We need to be far more optimistic, far more positive about the future of our country. Do you think though that should even consider resigning. It wouldn't break my heart if she did. Interesting range of views there uh, from uh, MPs. Ultimately, what's going to happen on, on Tuesday? Well, as I say, by best estimates, Theresa May is going to lose uh, that vote. What happens next? Well, that really is uh, anyone's guess. There are suggestions she could well resign as Prime Minister, uh, Tessa, though people who know her best say that is unlikely. She's got a real sense of, of duty. Could she face a challenge from within the Conservative Party? Could those Brexiteers finally get their 48 letters in uh, to force that leadership challenge? Or could the government itself face a vote of no confidence uh, from the Labour uh, Party? All we do know is that she could go back to Brussels and ask for more as there's an EU Council summit next Thursday and Friday. But again, uh, European sources telling me that they're unlikely to budge on this withdrawal agreement. So where it goes next? Well, as I say, it really is anyone's guess. You had to be a fly on the wall in that building behind you, Darren. Thank you very much. Our political editor, Darren McCaffrey there. Joining us now in the panel, we have a new guest, David Herzenhorn, the chief Brussels correspondent at Politico. And back with me is Swedish liberal MEP Jacinko Selimovic and Nina Schick, director of data and polling at Rasmussen Global. All right, David, I'll start with you. This, this new twist of a possibly a delayed vote, is that, is that a new twist in this Brexit drama? It's not a new twist, and there may be a delay, there may not be a delay. I think we may be thinking about this a little wrong, and mm -hmm. that is that this vote, if it goes down, is not necessarily as big a defeat for Theresa May as it will be a defeat mm -hmm. for the House of Commons, for the British Parliament in general, for the British um, government and society as a whole, which has never been able to get its act together on Brexit. I think what you'll find after this vote, if it goes the way we expect, is that people will realize Theresa May did her job. She reached a deal with the EU that would bring the UK safely out on withdrawal date. Any delay in this is not going to solve the problem, which is that mm. British society is divided roughly in thirds about what they want, and there's no fixing that. And so the minute the MPs vote no, they're going to be asked, well, what next? And what's next is two things that they've already said they don't want. So what do they want? They mm -hmm. haven't been able to answer that question, and it'll look just that same way right after this vote. I mean, even Politico was doing a, a list of what scenarios, you know, what, what could happen next. And you were both shaking your heads when there was a mention of a possible softening or Norway-style Norway uh, deal. So, okay, what is the most likely scenario here? Well, I, I found this, I do agree with you, the day will not change anything, but I think I found this idea of renegotiating the deal quite strange, not to say mm. on the verge of being insane. They were ne negotiating two years and they got the deal, What is this is the deal, 27 countries in Great Britain, and now they want another two years to negotiate? And then what? Then they will have another say of, of saying no or yes or no. This is the deal that is, that is done. It has to be voted in a parliament. Probably it will be voted down. 
and then probably they will have to go to referendum with that to find a, well, this, this is the question. Yeah. That's, that's up to them to decide. Right. But having an idea of changing this deal after two years of negotiation is, is kind of so strange that's out, to me. So what, what, what are you, Nina? Do you think it will be a referendum? It's the most likely, if it, because it seems like it's going to get voted down. I don't think that a second referendum is the most likely. Okay. It takes a long time to get to there. And I think mm. that if the deal is voted down and somehow with cosmetic changes, with, which I think are possible, although in terms of renegotiating substantially with the EU, I mean, you can forget about it. That's simply not on the table. I think if that deal somehow doesn't get through, then the most likely next scenario is actually no deal Brexit. So crash out simply because of incompetence. I don't think necessarily that a second referendum, well, it certainly wouldn't be permissible under Theresa May's government. She mm. would not be prime minister uh, putting that on the ballot paper again. Uh, I, I still think that one way or another, this deal somehow getting through is it's the most likely option. Do you, do you agree? And where does there that are make? there are okay. so many escape hatches to avoid right. a no deal Brexit, which nobody wants. That I disagree with that. I don't think there's any way we come to a no deal Brexit well. scenario because they will either withdraw the Article 50 trigger unilaterally, which the courts have now indicated they can do, or well, they will ask the UK, the it's... EU, for more time. But you know, there's been a lot of comparison to the troubled asset relief uh, program mm. vote in the House. I was right. in Congress that day, and I don't think the markets have priced in the possibility of this plan no going deal. down. Right. And I think what you will see most immediately is MPs staring a plummeting stock market, a plummeting pound. When the British pound is taking a hit, when voters start asking them, what in the heck have you done? We may see another vote in the Commons before we see mm. any talk more a second referendum because they will have to confront the reality of what they've done, which is undo mm. these 20 months of negotiations. Mm. There is no better deal in, in the cards. If you think Michel Barnier has no sympathy now, and I think when he talks about politicians taking responsibility, he's not talking about Theresa May. He's right. talking so about, about the MPs. Right. But if you think he has no sympathy now, just wait until they vote it down. The EU will have no sympathy for the UK at that point. They will be out there on their own. That's definitely off the table. And you were, you, you know, you're talking about voters and what, what they really feel. And now it's probably, probably a bit Brexited out uh, at the moment. Well, as politicians continue to debate Theresa May's withdrawal deal in Westminster, we decided to find out exactly what people in the UK are feeling less than four months to go until the Brexit deadline. Now, we sent Brian Carter from Brussels to communities along the English border. First, he spent some time in Wales, and today he's catching up with people on either side of the Scottish border. Carlisle in England, Gretna in, and Kirkpatrick Fleming on the Scottish side. And here is what he discovered. My trip across the United Kingdom's borders took me a few miles south of Scotland to the English city of Carlisle, where it's fair to say that the weather was a little less welcoming than the people. Curbing migration had been a powerful message in persuading people to vote leave. I wanted to see for myself the impact of Brexit on Britain's migrant communities. The Polish mother of two, Paulina, has lived in Britain for 14 years and is concerned about the future. Uh, I don't know, to be honest. I'm just, just worried, like everybody. So if you ask anyone from EU, everybody will give you the same answer. We pay taxes, we pay everything, so we are clear. So hope, hope so everything will be on good way. And the law, it will be like the same for every people, you know? So, finger crossed. Paulina's customer, Asha, born in Scotland and raised by Polish parents, is also worried about what leaving the EU might mean for her community. They're worried about living here, but also a lot have gone back home, an awful lot have gone back home, which is good in one way, that they're going back to where their roots are, but on the other hand, I think, you know, they've given so much to this country as well and they've got such a fantastic name the polls regarding their work ethic their work ethic is amazing um, which i'm so proud of that it was time for me to leave carlisle hop on the northbound train and head across the border so i'm now heading to scotland she's going through the lake district at the moment and the reason for going to scotland obviously is because in 2016 in the referendum they overwhelmingly voted to remain in the eu 62 percent of the people actually voted to remain so i'm quite keen to go up there and talk to the remainers and uh, see how they feel about brexit and where they think the country is going next i soon met 40 year old scottish remainer neil who works in advertising and feels very disillusioned about the whole Brexit process. It's not looking good and it looks like there's going to be an objection to every stage. That's really frustrating for me because I'm at a point now where I'm not sure I really care about 
what the deal is going to be. I just want a deal because it's went on so long now. And from my point of view, it's, it's strangling the economy. Even in my line of work, we're noticing that brands or companies don't want to spend because everybody's trying to figure out what the future holds. Having finally arrived in Scotland, I wanted to speak to the rural communities where uncertainty over Brexit threatens jobs and livelihoods. My name's Graham Ray. I'm an agricultural contractor, first and foremost, born and bred Kipati Fleming, South West Scotland. Graham, who's been in farming for nearly half a century, has a pretty straightforward opinion of the people running the country in Westminster. I've, I've had more common sense talked in a children's nursery, to be honest with you. I mean, they're just, it's just a nonsense when you see it. In, if, you, if you watch the programmes of, of, of Parliament, it, it's unbelievably childish the way they're behaving, all behaving. There's never going to be a Brexit deal that suits everybody. That's why the vote was, re was reasonably close. There's never going to be a deal that suits everybody, but we've, we've got to embrace it now and get on with it. Like most people I met in the UK, Graham thinks enough time has been wasted on the negotiations. The threat of a no Brexit and the threat of another two years of indecision and fighting, is, instead of running the country properly, is going to cause more bother than it's worth. I think we made the decision at the referendum, there's no need for another referendum. My journey ended back on the border between England and Scotland, two nations with a heavy past who have managed to bridge many of their differences. A common history commemorated by these man-made rock structures called cairns. Cairns like these are found all along the English-Scottish border. They are a testimony to the United Kingdom. But when it comes to Brexit, I found anything but unity. There is still a lot of uncertainty, fear and boredom about the whole divorce procedure. Whether or not these divisions can be overcome after Brexit, if Brexit happens, or if the problems here will be echoed across Europe remains to be seen. Brian Carter for Euronews at the English-Scottish border. I mean, as you were watching that, you know, I was I was asking uh, if whether you know Scotland will be, which overwhelmingly did, voted to remain, be trying to push for a vote of their own. So Nicola Sturgeon, obviously the leader of the SNP, is biding her political time very well at the start of the Brexit negotiations. You know, she started making overtures about independence again, but recently she's been very helpful to, to Theresa May. She's not being like the perennial thorn in Theresa May's style, side like the DUP. And the reason why she's doing this that is if the issue of Scottish independence ever comes on the table again, she can say she did everything to help Theresa May win those Brexit negotiations. It's a very canny political operator. I don't think Scottish independence, at least by her own wish, is off the table I mean, that's yet. That's really interesting. Political chess game there. All right, well, as Theresa May tries to win over political foes, two other leaders are busy making new friends. Facing a crisis at home, Venezuela's president is looking to Russia for an alliance. Let's take a look. Civil unrest, food shortages, rocketing inflation and international isolation. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro is in need of friends and it seems he's found one in Moscow. President Putin welcoming his South American counterpart to the Russian capital and voicing strong support for Mr. Maduro. Понимаем и знаем, что ситуация в этом цели остается сложной. Поддерживаем ваши усилия на то, чтобы добиться взаимопонимания в обществе. Ваши действия направлены на урегулирование отношений с оппозицией. Though a word of warning, President Maduro is facing a legitimacy crisis at home. Мы осуждаем любые действия, которые носят явно террористический характер, любые попытки изменить ситуацию с помощью сил. With both countries reliant on oil and wary of the United States, it looks like this could be a match made in heaven. David, what do you make of that friendship? Quite a couple. Well, that's not new. You know, Russia and Venezuela have their oil ties, and this goes back quite a while. And this is part of Putin's uh, overall effort to keep everybody off balance. He keeps friends where he can, knowing that Maduro is one of the few people who will join him in doing things that may raise eyebrows in Washington. Uh, mm -hmm. This is only an upside for Vladimir Putin, who doesn't bear any responsibility for the obvious crisis situation in Venezuela. Maduro, we know, should be better spent focusing on his starving citizens than mm -hmm. fooling around in Moscow. But this is where politics gets as, as cynical 
powerful as it gets. It, yeah, indeed. That's what politicians do, try to find friends where they can. All right, after the break on Raw Politics, how an online scheme in Germany may have tricked neo-Nazis into identifying themselves. That is next, so go away. Welcome back. Now, this week, a controversial German website launched, calling on the public to identify neo-Nazis at rallies. But the artists behind the site have revealed that there's much more to it than they let on. Alex and the team in the Cube have more on this. Alex? Well, Tessa, do you remember these scenes? Chemnitz, the town in Germany, fair to say I think a lot of people across Europe perhaps weren't that aware of until these demonstrations took place. Angry protesters, angry at government immigration policy. But in amongst these crowds, where it is fair to say, of course, there were ordinary people too with genuine grievances, there were elements of the far right and the extreme right, neo-Nazis. We saw in the cube, we proved that there were members there holding up fake information and doing the Nazi salute as well. This shocked Germany and really kicked off this discussion about how to tackle the rise of extremism in the country. Well, one group thought they had an idea. This website, which has now been taken down, was presented. What it allows you to do is to name and shame people you might recognize. In fact, the website offered a cash reward for naming and shaming your colleagues, acquaintances, or anyone you might recognize in photos uploaded on the website. Now, this is all something called doxing. It is where you uh, use the internet to obtain somebody's identity and then publicly broadcast it. In this context, you can see just how political that was. The idea is to unmask these neo-Nazis. But that wasn't really what was going on here at all. There was a twist. Let me show you. The group later revealed that actually it was a honeypot. Now, by that, we mean there was a feature on the site, a search feature, where by inputting your name, your details were taken. What they, they in fact were trying to do, Tessa, was not encourage people to name and shame the neo-Nazis on the far right. They wanted the far right to come online and unmask themselves by searching to see if they were on the site, by entering their name, their details were seized and grabbed. That is called a honeypot. You can see it's the honey, they trapped them. Now that is very controversial. It's really kicked off a discussion in Germany about what this means for individuals' data privacy, and their rights. But I spoke in an interview to Philip from the group. Uh, we call themselves the beautiful artists. Interestingly, that site was eventually taken down. And he said, we operate in an area of moral ambiguity, he says. But this data collection, he said, well, this was certainly right to do because the German state is not doing it. Their argument being, people need to do more to unmask and tackle the problem of the far right. But then there are others on social media, just finishing on what uh, Paul Joseph's saying here. It's all, he said it's almost Stasi style what they were trying to do. So Tessa, the website has been taken down, but all uh, the idea here was to try and unmask and tackle far right extremism in uh, Germany. Now you can see just how complicated even efforts to deal with it can get. All right, thank you for that, Alex and the Cube team. And joining me in the studio to talk about this neo-Nazi honeypot scheme is Baron Kohlmel, an independent German MEP sitting with the ECR Group. And still with me is Nina Schick of Rasmussen Global and David Hirschenhorn of Politico. All right, um, I I'd like to talk to you, Bernd, because, you know, the intention here was to tackle extremism. That was the intention. Mm -hmm. You're a former policeman. Is there anything about this that raises red flags for you? Yes, absolutely. For me, it is unacceptable what this organization did. These are uh, Stasi methods, and I think this will polarize the whole society. It is a task for the state, especially for the police, to look if there are riots, if there are persons uh, who did a crime, then the police have to do the job, but not others. And please think if another organization would do the same with the left wing, the far left wing, then we would have a scandal in Germany. So I think we are not balanced in this situation. I say this is unacceptable and the state must act against this because this organization, they collected data. And uh, this is uh, far away from a transparent system. Mm. Nobody knows what they will do with this uh, data. Uh, that could be that uh, really normal citizens are now in a database of this organization. Yeah, the argument of the artist was that the government, the state, doesn't seem to be doing enough to tackle you know, uh, the rise this, of extremism. This argument comes from people mm. who are going for demonstrations wrapped 
they want that the policeman uh, shows uh, mm. a clear um, name on his right. jacket and uh, say self, uh, they are wrapped, this is unacceptable. And, and the big issue also is, is invasion of privacy, you were saying. I mean, which of the, these, uh, what part of it that bothers you, Nina, if, if anything? First of all, the practice of doxing, which has already happened in multiple mm -hmm. cases, is very dangerous because it has ruined people's lives, you know, when they're named and shamed on the internet for things they didn't do. Um, so I think you have to be very careful. The second thing is that something like this has become highly, highly politicized. And I understand in the mm. context of Germany, given our recent history, why this is so emotional. But mm. if the aim of doing this is to expose neo-Nazis and thereby name and shame them and, you know, suppress the far right or neo-Nazi beliefs, it will have exactly the opposite, opposite effect because you can imagine how people on the far right will argue that, you know, this is hampering on their free speech, that it's outrageous. Mm. Exactly. So I think it's extremely yeah. divisive tactics, which is better actually left in the hands of the, the security services who, who have a job to track people who are dangerous and not kind of uh, allow this kind of mob mentality to the take over a very yeah. vigilante, very, very emotional, mm -hmm. visceral debate. I mean, let, just putting a bit of context, I mean, David, you're saying that this should be in the hands of authorities, but we do have, uh, we know that 467 violent neo-Nazis are still at large despite active arrest warrants. So there's the context. There's a strong message here, right, for the German government, and that is that there is a demand for more to be done. I mean, the other mm. question becomes, what about these, the complexities in these data protection mm -hmm. laws? We know Germany has some of the strongest mm -hmm. um, laws against hate speech, mm -hmm. maybe uh, to its credit, but also some of the strongest data protection laws that yeah. then present a problem if those data privacy rights are used in order to go about hate speech, hate crimes, uh, you know, it's hard to imagine that I should feel um, sorry for someone who feels their privacy rights have been violated when they're out on the street in public making right. a Nazi salute. Absolutely. As a journalist, I would much rather have a free flow of information on sure. all counts. Yes, it yeah. has to be used responsibly. Yes, the state should be doing its job. Yes, uh, vigilante justice has its limitations. But you've got a problem when it somehow is okay, you're entitled to the privacy of going out on the street and engaging in hate right. speech in a country where yeah. it's illegal. And, and, I think that's, and I think that's quite right, because often, you know, activists on the far right say, this is my right to have free speech. And there has to be a very strong distinction between free speech and inciting hatred. And sure. I think it's correct that people who are inciting hatred or spewing ridiculous racist nonsense are held to account for those actions. And very quickly, I'll give you the last word. Go ahead, Bert. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. But uh, again, this must be balanced in the state. Balanced from the far right, also to the far left, and then the state must have the power to do the job. I think you're, the point you're making is that we should, when we talk about extremism, we talk about both, uh, yeah. both types of extremism. Absolutely. Point. Okay, well, a lot more coming up on Iran politics. After the break, the EU unveils its plan to tackle misinformation ahead of the European elections. More on that coming up. Welcome back. Now, wasting no time, the EU has proposed a brand new action plan to tackle fake news ahead of next year's elections. At the heart of it, more money, an early warning system and monthly progress reports. And here is uh, Vice President Andres Ansip. There is strong evidence pointing uh, to Russia as a primary source of disinformation in Europe. This information is part of Russia's military doctrine and its strategy to divide and weaken the West. Russia spends 1.1 billion euros a year on pro-Kremlin media. All right, so that was Commission uh, Vice President Andres Ansip. And joining us now in the studio to talk about this is Jennifer Baker, a journalist with BrusselsGeek.com, focusing on tech issues. And still with us, Nina Sheik of Rasmussen Global and Bernd Kohlmill, an independent German MEP sitting with the ECR group. All right, Nina, you did speak to the, the Commission uh, today who had, uh, you know, put this package together. Is this, is this package, from your point of view, enough to tackle indeed? I think it's a wonderful first step because I think the world is waking up to the fact that hybrid warfare, war in the 21st century, is changing dramatically. It's no longer about, you know, tanks over borders, but it's very much about who controls the narrative in the information space. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something that Russia has been doing for decades, so the playbook is not new. 
What's new is the technology and mm. the reach. Mm. And we know there have been Russian campaigns in both the presidential election. We know there have been Russian campaigns of information in Brexit and in many other European countries. So it's great that the commission is doing something it is, ahead it is of a the European step. parliamentary elections. But this is now the new paradigm. And I yeah, think sure. that five million is a start. But boy, are we just starting to scratch <laughs> Dealing with the with a lot more. And I mean, from a, from a you, you, tech point of view, yeah monthly reports on what has been done already. How effective is it? It feels like it's 10 steps behind what is what is currently out there in terms of misinformation and fake news. Well, I agree with Nina that it is a step in the right direction, but it, in, in the Commission's very own Q&A, it writes its own questions and it says, is this timely? And it says, yes, this is timely. Of course it's not timely. It's far too little too late. Five million is far too little to combat a, a Russian organization that is pumping billions into it. And it is too late. It's a very arbitrary time frame to say, oh, we're going to start in January and then May. People will already have made up their minds within, you know, a matter of weeks. And this is the thing about what's so insidious about this new, uh, new form of disinformation is that it only takes a few uh, pieces of disinformation to really uh, get into your stream and create the filter bubbles and create mm. this kind of echo chamber where people think that is the only reasonable viewpoint to have. And unfortunately, this comes about because we've got micro-targeting, which mm. is where all this data that's gathered about you allows you to be manipulated at the point in time when you're most vulnerable. Mm. And unless we break this addiction of, of media to behavioral advertising, we're never going to stop these silos of data about us as individuals, as voters being built up, that allows the disinformation to be so very effective. Yeah, and they're, they're planning even an alert system. I mean, how, no, really, how effective would that be? I think we should not expect a wonder of these measures. Uh, it's the right <laughs> uh, step. Uh, to right. tackle this, um, but as you said, uh, it is not really new. New is only the amount and the possibilities. Mm. I think the best way to uh, fight against fake news are to provide citizens with the right news. This is a task of the media to show the spectrum. And especially in Germany, we have the problem that you uh, not get really Do you disagree? a spectrum. Well, no, I agree, and that there is part yeah. of that in, in, in the plans that were outlined uh, to, to sort of create new uh, sort of mm. programs for, for media literacy yeah. and enforce uh, you know, solid journalism. But I would insert yeah. a note of Sorry, caution that we shouldn't really be putting it in the hands of tech companies that are, be honest, in the mm. business of making money yeah. to decide what is and isn't real information. Yeah. Right. And, and, and on that note, I think the Commission's efforts yeah. have to be applauded because so often kind of policy or regulation around this area is so regressive and the exponential kind of leap in the technology and how it's accelerating versus, you know, the policy response is simply not adequate. So mm. the fact that they're trying, A, to monitor and actually get some data to understand what's happening it has value inherently and in itself. The second bit of mm. value of this is, of course, to spread that information right. within the policy community so they can actually begin to understand the scale of the challenge. I mean, you only need to look at how, you know, Facebook, the, when Facebook was in being grilled by the House and the Senators, mm -hmm. what questions were being asked to Mark Zuckerberg to see how wide right. the gulf yeah. between the policy community mm -hmm. and the tech community. So there has to be a, a, a response that tries to so bring I think, that together. I think the point that everyone make, is making here is it is a step in the right direction, although, you know, a, a long way to go, but a step uh, in, in the right way. All right, now for tonight's raw moment, which comes from the UK, where a young boys meeting with the Queen proved a bit too much to handle. Let's take a look. I mean, that is quite a cute reaction. <laughs> Who wants to comment on that? It is That's cool. real life. It's amazing. I thought he was about to curtsy. I bet there's a lot of adults who kind of wish they could do no that a lot news. of the time. I know, that is it. No, absolutely. All right, thank you very much for joining us tonight on Raw Politics. And we do want to hear what you're talking about. Get in touch with me on Twitter, at Tessa or Celia, or at your news and use the hashtag Raw Politics. Have a good evening and see you again soon. Bye.